Welcome, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you're tuning in from. Welcome to our next edition of Facebook Live Journal Club webinar series. Um, sponsored by Hallmark Advanced Veterinary Imaging, so thanks to Hallmark for this session. Uh, in these webinars, if you've not attended before, uh, why not? Uh, uh, we are joined by rising stars of the profession, and we give them a chance to discuss uh, recently published work, um, which uh, most of the time has some neuroimaging components. And today, we are honoured to welcome Dr. Abby Crawford, who has recently published some work on clinical presentation, diagnosis, treatment and outcome of global hypoxic ischemic brain injury in dogs and cats. Not something we really hope to see, but uh, unfortunately, um, but a really important scenario to be aware of. So by way of introduction, before we get going, um, Abby graduated from the University of Edinburgh and took a small animal rotating internship at the Royal Veterinary College in London. And uh, after a year in general practice, she began a neuroscience PhD at the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Professor Robin Franklin. In 2015, she enrolled in a senior clinical training scholarship in neurology and neurosurgery at the Royal Veterinary College and in 2018 obtained the Diploma of European College of Veterinary Neurology. She is currently a lecturer in neurology and neurosurgery with a postdoctoral research position studying mitochondrial transplantation as a potential treatment option for hypoxic ischemic brain injury. Wow. That is a, that is a uh, intense area of study, Abby. Welcome today. Um, thanks very Thank much you. for giving up your time and we appreciate you being here. Um, we uh, um, would uh, be happy with you to get started and um, so if you're okay to throw up your slides, we're looking forward to finding more out about this study. Thank you. Um, please let me know if there's any problems with my sound or the slides. Um, so I just thought I would just start by a little bit of background as to why we wanted to do this case series. And I think is maybe often a common stimulus for, for wanting to do a little research project is um, a, a challenging clinical case that we had. So um, we had a seven month old male entire Cocker Spaniel that presented to us following a laryngeal obstruction. Uh, it was quite a sad case. He'd managed to steal a great slab of cheese um, without the owner realising. She initially thought he was vomiting, put him in the garden, but then promptly realised it was something more serious. And, and she wasn't far from our hospital, so she uh, rushed him down, um, but thought he'd probably stopped breathing about two minutes prior to arrival at our hospital. Our ECC team um, did an amazing um, effort in terms of resuscitating the dog, but it took 22 minutes to establish return of spontaneous circulation. Thereafter, this dog underwent really extensive rehabilitation, but I'm sad to say he was ultimately euthanized because we just couldn't achieve sufficient quality of life. And this was a case that I was just desperate for more information to try and provide the owners with, with a realistic prognosis. Um, so a little bit of background, um, you're probably aware the brain accounts for around 2% of total body mass, but it actually utilises around 20% of total body glucose. It has fairly limited local glucose storage and very minimal reserves of high energy phosphates, and thus it needs a really consistent supply of glucose and oxygen. We see ischemia developing if the cerebral perfusion fails to meet those energy demands and waste removal requirements. And we know that within just a few minutes of, of ischemia onset, we can start to see irreparable neuronal damage. So um, a sort of cascade of events that we might anticipate would be depletion of those ATP reserves, resulting in a failure of the sodium potassium ATPase, therefore secondary influx of, of sodium into the cells and with that water. So we have swollen neurons, particularly they become depolarized by that intracellular flux of sodium leading to release of glutamate, then calcium influx and activation of these programmed cell death pathways. And that's just, you know, only part of the pathway. We'll also see things like mitochondrial disruption, lipid peroxidation, inflammatory mediator release, all contributing to this progressive injury. When we talk about global hypoxic ischemic brain injury, and you'll see I use this acronym quite a lot, GHBI, it occurs secondary to, to generalised reduction in cerebral perfusion. And studies have shown that neurons are particularly susceptible and those being within the cerebral cortex, hippocampus and Purkinje neurons of the cerebellum most so. In the veterinary literature, global hypoxic ischemic brain injury has been reported after GA, and there's some studies particularly looking at mouth gag use for dental procedures in cats, 
Um, there's a case report of severe bite injury, strangulation, and also cardiopulmonary arrest with resuscitation. So in people, the outcome after global hypoxic ischemic brain injury is often poor. Survival rates of between 7 and 30% have been uh, documented with out-of-hospital cardiopulmonary arrest. And primary cardiovascular disease is a major cause of out-of-hospital cardiopulmonary arrest in, in people. Uh, the initial neurological deficits can be quite severe, but the ultimate outcome is very challenging to predict particularly in those early days, the first sort of 24 to 72 hours after resuscitation. And typically a combination um, of tools is used to try and support prognostication. So serial neurological assessments, electrodiagnostic evaluation, advanced imaging and serum bio biomarkers are often used in combination. So aims and hypotheses, we were aiming to retrospectively describe clinical cases of global hypoxic ischemic brain injury. Um, as mentioned in the title, we were looking at presenting clinical signs, diagnosis, treatment, outcome, and particularly interested in considering potential clinical indicators of prognosis. We hypothesized that a prolonged duration of that hypoxic ischemic insult and minimal or no neurological improvement in the first 72 hours after the insult could be negative prognostic indicators. Um, methods, just really briefly, so it was a retrospective case series. We pulled back through records between 2010 and 22, um, 2022, and we used various search criteria, including global brain ischemia, return of spontaneous circulation. Our inclusion criteria, we were looking for obviously complete medical records, new onset of neurological deficits after that suspected or documented hypoxic ischemic event. And then we wanted serial neurological reassessments performed by a veterinary neurologist or a neurology resident in training. We excluded cases that had evidence of pre-existing intracranial or concurrent systemic disease that could have been the cause of the identified neurological deficits. So in total, we, we had uh, just 10 cases. We had eight that had an in-hospital global hypoxic ischemic brain injury and two with an out-of-hospital one. So if we start with the in-hospital global hypoxic ischemic brain injury cases, we had six dogs and two cats. So we had four dogs that suffered a cardiopulmonary arrest during anesthesia. We had one dog that arrested secondary to hypovolemia and anemia due to severe hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. We had a, a case of a, a fairly young dog that collapsed after a walk um, and that rapidly progressed to cardiopulmonary arrest. And then we had a cat that had a cardiopulmonary arrest during investigation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a fulminant left-sided heart failure. Now, in these cases, cardiopulmonary resuscitation was promptly initiated and we had return of spontaneous circulation documented within a median of three minutes. The last of our in-hospital cases was a Maine Coon cat, um, and that had a very prolonged recovery after an anaesthetic with an acute onset of seizures. Um, that anaesthetic was for a dental procedure, and there was not a, an obvious complication documented, um, but presumed that there had been an accident given the onset of signs post-anesthesia. So a uh, bit of a text heavy slide, apologies, but neurological examination findings uh, varied. Um, but the initial neurological assessments documented obtundation in six of the cases, disorientation in two, stupor in one, coma in one. We had six of the cases showing non-ambulatory tetraparesis. We had one dog that had decerebellar rigidity posture. We had a cerebellar ataxia and intention tremors. And then some of the documented cranial nerve deficits included an absent menace response bilaterally, absent vision, decreased to absent response to nasal stimulation and decreased to absent gag reflex. Generalized seizures were observed in the hospital in two dogs and one cat. And our neuroanatomical localization was brainstem in three of these cases, diffuse forebrain and brainstem in one and diffuse forebrain and cerebellum in two. So we suspected a global hypoxic ischemic brain injury in all of these cases based on this history of a documented cardiopulmonary arrest or poor recovery from GA. The onset of neurological deficits following anesthesia or return of spontaneous circulation and then the bilateral symmetrical nature of the neurological deficits. 
some of the cases had additional diagnostics. Uh, so the main coon cat, which had had the prolonged recovery from dental, had MRI of the head performed 24 hours after it presented to us. The changes were quite mild. So here we've got uh, T2 weighted and T2 weighted flare images transverse at the level of the intersplamic adhesion in A and B and the medial genetic nucleus in C and D. And as I said, the changes are subtle, but we could appreciate uh, fairly mild, um, bilaterally symmetrical, ill-defined hyperintensity on both T2 and flare images of the um, cerebral cortex, particularly the parietal and occipital lobes, as indicated by the arrows. The British short hair cat, which was the one that had a cardiopulmonary arrest whilst having a workup for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, had an EEG performed six hours post return of spontaneous circulation. This documented continuous low voltage background activity of around 50 microvolts. The dog that collapsed after a walk was intubated and uh, manually ventilated when it arrived to us. Its initial neurological examination revealed a uh, comatose mental status, fixed dilated pupils. It had an absent vestibular ocular reflex, absent gag reflex. A modified Glasgow coma scale of four was recorded and this remained static over the subsequent 12 hours. Somatosensory what potentials were evaluated after left and right static nerve stimulation and we found no detectable response. This dog had uh, MRI performed, as you can see in the figure below, um, and we found quite severe diffuse changes. So there was a, a generalized T2-weighted hyperintensity of the cortical gray matter um, relative to normal gray matter. Hopefully you can appreciate. So we've got in A, a T2-weighted uh, sagittal, and then we've got two transverse images. And what we... Um, what we're trying to highlight here is we've got loss of the cerebral sulci due to this diffuse swelling of the cortical gray matter. Um, we've got loss of distinction between the gray and white matter. We've got um, compression of all the ventricles and we've got caudal transtentorial and frame and magnum herniation causing severe compression of the underlying brain stem. So we felt these changes were most consistent with, with the generalized cytotoxic edema secondary to global hypoxic ischemic brain injury. Given the severity of the clinical presentation, the severity of the MRI findings, our electrodiagnostic evaluations, uh, the dog's prognosis was deemed grave and the owners elected for euthanasia. A post-mortem was performed 24 hours later um, and on gross examination in the, in the top picture there, you could, well, I don't know if you can, but we could appreciate a uh, fairly diffuse swelling of the brain with secondary compression of the cerebellum, the brain stem and the proximal cervical spinal cord. At this early time point, the histopathological changes were fairly mild, but there was some um, edema change within the granular layer of the cerebellar cortex and some um, acute hemorrhage within the proximal cervical spinal cord. So um, we obviously lost one dog at that early time point, but the remaining seven cases in the new hospital group Treatment consisted of supporting nursing care, including regular turning, assistance to feed and drink, physiotherapy, anti-epileptic medication was started in the three patients in which generalized seizures were observed. And then the case that had uh, severe hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, hypovolemia and anemia, that dog received oxygen therapy, had a nasogastric tube placed, and it received a packed red blood cell transfusion. Now, in all of these cases, improvements in both mentation and uh, ambulation were documented within two to three days um, of hospitalization. And then we would typically see continued improvements every one to two days thereafter. In four of those patients, we had some serial assessments of the modified uh, Glasgow coma scale. And this is a bit tedious to try and read out to you. So I've tried to summarize it in, in this potentially fairly unhelpful table. So two dogs, two cats. The initial um, scale that we recorded, so in this case was uh, seven, but within 24 hours, it rose to 13. It remained stable at that level and, and recording was discontinued thereafter. And there's a similar trend in, in the other cases. So our initial, while well, our initial scale varies, we can consistently see quite a rapid improvement within the first nine to 33 hours. 
The median duration of hospitalization for these cases was seven days. And our reevaluation time points did vary. We had a median follow up of, of 67 days, um, with, but with quite a wide range 12 to 180. At the time of follow up, so the last documented uh, reevaluation of these patients, four had recovered fully with no neurological deficits. And the other three had persistent deficits, including decreased to absent menace response bilaterally in all three impaired vision in two and absent vision in one. That was the main coon with the dental procedure. And one of the patients was ambulatory tetraparetic with a mild generalized hyponatria. Okay, so that's the in-hospital cases. Then we had two out-of-hospital global hypoxic ischemic brain injury cases. So we had a, a six-month-old male entire Vimorana that presented to the referring vets in cardiopulmonary arrest after a road traffic accident. They reported a return of spontaneous circulation, <clears throat> excuse me, after 10 minutes. However, on arrival to us, this dog was comatosed with fixed dilated pupils, an absent vestibular ocular reflex, an absent gag reflex, an absent corneal reflex. Um, there's a video of this dog um, attached to the, the manuscript uh, on the JVM website, if anyone would like to have a look. Um, we localized to diffuse brainstem, and the patient arrived intubated and ventilated and remained in this way. CT was performed, um, which documented no evidence of, of skull fractures. Um, there was signs consistent with pulmonary contusions and a low volume of peritoneal uh, effusion, presumed to be hemorrhage. Subsequent MRI of the head. Here we have T2-weighted sagittal and transverse uh, images. And again, similar to the case we looked at previously, we can see very severe diffuse changes. So there's a generalized T2-weighted hyperintensity of the, the cerebral cortical gray matter. Um, we've again got a loss of distinction between gray and white matter, generalized swelling of the gray matter, compression of the ventricles, and again, frame and magnum herniation, caudal transtentorial herniation, severe brainstem compression. Now, given just how um, diffuse and extensive these changes are, we felt they were consistent with, with global hypoxic ischemic brain injury. And we felt that a traumatic brain injury much less likely given the absence of skull fractures, the absence of hemorrhage. And the last was my friend, the little seven month old intact male cocker spaniel that presented apneic with no palpable peripheral pulses, secondary to laryngeal obstruction by a foreign body, cheese. This dog had had a, retain, a return of spontaneous circulation after 22 minutes of resuscitation efforts, including external defibrillation. I met him three hours after his return of spontaneous circulation, at which time he was markedly obtunded, disorientated, non-ambulatory tetraparetic. He had absent menace response and absent vision bilaterally. And again, there's a video of him online. So his neuroanatomical localization was diffuse forebrain and brainstem. He underwent very prolonged treatment. So he had incredible nursing care from our ICU and neurology nurses. Um, initially, he required sedation to manage his severe disorientation and vocalization. So he received dexmedetomidine and midazolam constant rate infusions. He had oxygen ther therapy and intensive physiotherapy. Given these episodes of profound uh, vocalization, uh, often accompanied by um, running attempts, there was slight concern, could they represent seizure activity? And he had an EEG performed um, a few days after his, his um, return of spontaneous circulation. This documented no epileptorum activity, and we found discontinuous low voltage background activity of around 15 microvolts. Interestingly, his modified Glasgow coma scale was 14 um, initially, and that was recorded six hours after onset. And this remained static on repeat assessments over the next 96 hours, and recording was then discontinued thereafter. He showed very slight improvements in his mentation and gait. So he would um, show a, a gradual reduction in his episodic vocalization over two weeks. And he regained independent ambulation 17 days after return of spontaneous circulation. He ultimately stayed with us for 25 days and then his owners decided to continue his care at home and continued really amazing levels of care, very intensive rehabilitation. We re-examined him 18 days later, but at which time he was still severely disoriented. He was ambulatory tetraparetic, 
hypermetric. He had quite a pronounced vestibular ataxia and he showed compulsive circling to the left. He'd also developed a resting horizontal nystagmus, um, fast phase to the right, and he remained with an absent menace response bilaterally. Um, and I'm very sad to say that he was then ultimately euthanized 58 days after he presented due to concerns over quality of life and the severity of his ongoing neurological deficits. Um, he uh, underwent post-mortem examination and this figure was prepared by Dylan, a very talented pathologist, and I am absolutely not going to um, do it justice when I attempt to describe the changes, but let's see. So we have some formal and fixed uh, sections of the, the forebrain and midbrain. Um, we can see parietal and temporal cortex. And what I hope you might be able to appreciate is there is really marked thinning and, and discoloration of the cerebral cortex of the parietal and temporal lobes. Maybe it made easier if you compare it to the more normal looking cortex down here. Here we have H&E sections um, that correlate to these images and hopefully you can appreciate just the absolute loss of parenchyma in the cerebral cortex here. If we go in higher power again, again H&E, but this time we're looking at the occipital cortex, you can just see neuropil loss, spongiosis, neovascularization, basically just loss of cerebral cortex. And this is the hippocampus. Um, the arrows are trying to highlight neuronal loss and maybe slightly easier to interpret cere um, cerebellar cortex here. And we've got really marked loss of the Purkinje neuronal layer. So a little review, how am I doing for time? A little review of discussion. Um, apologies again, some of these text uh, slides are a little text heavy, um, really just to, um, help my weary brain please don't feel the need to read this i will i will cover everything so we had four dogs that had cardiopulmonary arrest under anesthesia and then we had the main coon cat in which we considered a perianesthetic cardiopulmonary arrest most likely given the fact this cat had a very prolonged recovery after a dental procedure sadly we don't know if a gag was used in that general anesthetic and i'll come on to that next um, mortality rates in dogs and cats undergoing anesthesia or sedation have been documented between 0.24 and 0.9%. But of course, it's a lot harder to, to accurately assess prevalence of anesthesia associated complications. Um, and it's possible that actually there are far more of these than, than we realize. Um, post anesthesia cortical blindness has been reported in cats in association with the use of mouth gags resulting in prolonged opening of the mouth during dental procedures. And I've taken this lovely image from, from this paper that very nicely used magnetic resonance and geography to look at um, blood flow through the maxillary artery. So in the top, um, blood flow through the maxillary artery is indicated by one, and this is a cat with its mouth closed. And then in the image below, the mouth has then been open and you can see there's just a complete loss of blood flow through that maxillary artery, um, resulting in compromised cerebral blood flow. We had a positive outcome in six out of eight cases with an in-hospital hypoxic ischemic event. And that's likely reflecting the very prompt recognition and the rapid initiation of CPR. In a study of perinatal rats, it was shown that the duration of that hypoxic ischemic insult has a linear association with neuronal loss and injury severity. And interestingly, it's also been shown, maybe not surprisingly, that more severe brain injury is identified after asphyxial cardiac arrest compared to ventriculation, uh, ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest. So in asphyxiation, your arterial oxygenation is gonna decrease with increasing hypercapnia before you get the onset of cardiac arrest. In contrast, oxygenation should be fairly normal at the onset of ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest. We obviously don't have enough cases to draw any conclusions, but we did have my friend, the Cocker Spaniel, that presented with an asphyxial cardiac arrest, secondary to laryngeal obstruction, and he had a poor outcome and was ultimately euthanized because of that uh, failure to recover. Um, something I think is quite interesting. So in people with global hypoxic ischemic brain injury, they can have an extremely severe neurological presentation, but that does not preclude them going on to have an acceptable functional outcome. And certainly in our case series, the neurological deficits were often very severe to start with, predominantly localizing to the forebrain, brainstem, or both. Of our cases that went on to have a more positive outcome, 
we would tend to see a detectable improvement within 48 to 72 hours of their hypoxic ischemic insult. And then we would see continued improvement thereafter. Contrast that with the three dogs that had a, a poor outcome, two were euthanized promptly after presentation because they had such severe deficits consistent with diffuse brainstem involvement. And we visualized marked brainstem compression on MRI. The third dog was euthanized because of the severity of its ongoing deficits. And that dog showed very minimal um, improvements in its neurological status. And so perhaps the presence of neurological deficits consistent with diffuse brainstem involvement and rate of neurological improvement after the onset of the, the hypoxic ischemic insult could be useful indicators of, of prognosis for these patients. Grading systems um, to enable serial quantified recordings of neurological progress would obviously um, potentially be very useful, um, helping us to facilitate and quantify assessment. Um, we know about the modified Glasgow Coma Score. It's a fantastic um, means of evaluating traumatic brain injury. It's been validated for use in dogs with traumatic brain injury. So could it also offer a valuable tool in the serial evaluation of our hypoxic ischemic brain injury cases? It unfortunately was recorded fairly infrequently and very inconsistently in our cases, but we were able to document progressive improvements of the modified Glasgow Coma Scale in four of our patients over the initial nine to 33 hours. In contrast, the dog that really didn't do well, that was euthanized because of its um, severe ongoing deficits, that dog had a modified Glasgow Coma Score that remained static over, over the 96 hours of recording. So perhaps using this as a way of looking for improvement might help us uh, support a better prognosis. But I do think it's interesting to flag up that the initial um, um, scale that we gave that Cocker Spaniel was higher than the other four dogs. So therefore, a comparatively less severe initial assessment is not necessarily indicative of, of a positive outcome. So it's more a trend over time as opposed to a single value or an initial assessment. And then I mentioned at the beginning that when, prognos uh, when they're trying to prognosticate human patients with global hypoxic ischemia injury, they tend to try and utilize um, multiple different facets. So serial neurological assessment is key, and that will then often be supported by advanced imaging, typically MRI, electrodiagnostic evaluation, and plasma biomarkers. So just really briefly, MRI, incredible for characterizing lesion extent and severity. Negative prognostic indicators in people are identification of very diffuse brain injury, specifically attenuation of grey and white matter interface. And there's quite a bit of literature looking at diffusion weighted imaging to provide prognostic, indica uh, prognostic information after cardiopulmonary arrest in people. Interestingly, if you can document normal DWI a week after return of spontaneous circulation, that's a really good uh, uh, indicator of good outcome. Electrodiagnostics. Electroencephalography, EEG, is um, recorded as a useful tool to assess severity of the insult and to provide prognostic information. You tend to see suppressed background activity patterns immediately after the cardiac arrest. And then we're looking to see gradual increases in both amplitude and continuity of EEG background activity. A progression towards continuous normal voltage background activity within 24 hours of cardiac arrest is associated with good outcome in people. And so obviously, ideally, you would have continuous EEG monitoring to be able to track these trends over time. Poor prognostic indicators would be suppressed background activity, non or poorly responsive EEG patterns, so say no response to auditory tactile noxious stimulus, and a presence of periodic generalized phenomena are, are also associated with poor outcomes. Other things that we briefly talk about in the, in the manuscript are somatosensory evoke potentials and brainstem auditory evoke potentials. Maybe again, these are tools that we could be using for these patients. And lastly, plasma biomarkers. So in, in human patients, neuron-specific enolase is, um, is shown to be useful. So it's released from injured neurons. Its plasma concentration correlates with the severity of the hypoxic ischemic brain injury. And other biomarkers of interest are S100 beta, released from damaged glial cells, protein tau, released from damaged axons.
There are some nice veterinary studies looking at some of these um, biomarkers in different diseases. So NSE and distemper. There's some nice studies looking at, at neurofilament light chain and MUO and cognitive decline. Um, a really nice study looking at uh, GFAP in spinal cord injury patients. Um, but thus far, we, we still need some studies to evaluate the cl clinical utility of these biomarkers in global hypoxic ischemic brain injury. And very lastly, two dogs presented comatose and they required mechanical ventilation. And both of these were euthanized um, fairly promptly after presentation because their prognosis was deemed grave. But interestingly, in people, it's recommended that prognostication is delayed for at least 72 hours after return of spontaneous circulation, raising the question of did we progress too quickly to make a, a prognosis in these patients? Should we have given them more time? Should we have had a more multimodal approach? And I also think it's uh, you know, interesting to consider that maybe we should be using a multimodal approach in, in all patients, including those less severely affected ones, because perhaps that would help us recognize the patients that aren't going to have a good outcome and so avoid these really prolonged efforts at, at rehabilitation. Inevitably, we had some limitations, just to name a few. This was just a very small um, number of cases, it's retrospective. We had limited information on the anesthetic monitoring and, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation performed at the referring veterinary surgeons. We only had histopath in two, advanced imaging in three, and it's possible that we had concurrent metabolic or cardiovascular derangements contributing to some of the neurological signs we were seeing. We also had very variable follow-up. But in confusion, apologies for that word, leave it. Um, global hypoxic ischemic brain injury in dogs and cats can be associated with a range of etiologies. Despite these patients looking potentially very severe on initial presentation, they can go on to do very well. The duration of that hypoxic ischemic insult and the rate of their subsequent neurological improvement could provide us useful indications on prognosis. So obviously these longer insults, particularly out of hospital arrests in which uh, resuscitation is delayed and patients that have um, slower recoveries, maybe these are less likely to, to do as well. And also diffuse brainstem involvement um, may well be an indicator of poor outcome. Thank you very much. I hope you're still there and I hope it was very useful. Thank you very much, Abby, for this great presentation. Um, there is a few um, question, really, really good, actually, uh, question. The first one from Fred. Um, are there any diffusion images to support the concern for cytotoxic edema? No, our reviewers were quite in agreement with you. I'm sad to say no, there wasn't. Um, so I think in both the dogs, the MRI was almost um, an add-on. We already had a really grave prognosis based on the clinical assessment of these patients. And I guess the MRI was performed to try and <coughs> corroborate that. And we did that. Um, with a little deal that we would just do absolute bare minimum images. So I think we had T2 sagittal transverse in one. I think we had a gradient echo T2 and flare images in the other. And we don't have diffusion weighted, which is a, a real shame. And it's definitely something that I would strive for next time if we want to be safe. Okay, good. Um, there are two questions that are actually very similar. Um, and I'm going to read them at this, um, one after the other one. The, they both concern... Um, the presence of cytotoxic edema and um, whether or not to use mannitol or hypertonic saline, despite knowing that usually they are uh, indicated for vasovenic edema. And um, a similar question as well from Kuhn, um, would you consider any specific measure to decrease ICP in cases such as this, we suspected increased ICP due to cytotoxic edema? Yeah, great questions. And I'm not sure how wonderful my answer will be, but I was doing a bit of reading about um, the recommendations because there's some really nice recover guidelines. Um, I think it's in JVEC. Um, from about, they're from a while ago now, but they're basically discussing whether or not we should consider efforts to decrease intracranial pressure, specifically with mannitol and hypertonic saline. And they've, they've covered the literature. I think it's up until about 2012, so maybe there's something new now. Um, but there isn't any definitive evidence to say that either of those are indicated or which patients may benefit. That being said, I think they acknowledge that if you don't see an immediate contraindication in your case, do you have a lot to you to lose? And 
I'd be interested to, see, to hear what you guys think. I don't think that I would, I would exclude the possibility. I just think it would be quite hard to say definitively we think it's going to, to help. Um, so I would just do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I don't know if you guys have got different opinions. Yeah, I mean, in theory, you, you're not expected to work, but I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But it looks like yeah. in human, they already assessed that and they haven't come to a, a conclusion on that or yeah. they don't think there's any, uh, any improvement. Um, another question from Fred. I think Fred probably is not working today. Um, <laughs> what is the place of supplemental oxygen in therapy, friend or, friend or foe? Yeah, again, I think there's conflicting evidences there, but I think, again, it's being used in the right hands, isn't it, and in the right clinical case. And we certainly had some where, you know, hy hypoxemia, hypoxia was a, a clinical concern. And so they did receive a supplemental oxygen. Then we had the cases that were mechanically ventilated, and obviously that was a different scenario. But I, I don't think that there is any great clinical data to tell you which case how to monitor it for how long and maybe that would be a really nice discussion to have with some of our criticalist colleagues because they're probably rather more savvy on that than i am um fred wanted to come back to say that actually he's doing some work i'll remove that teasing him a bit um and another question from shaheen uh, about the use of progesterone i am neuroprotective effect yeah, I think that's gaining momentum, isn't it? But I, I really can't comment as to the latest studies on that. I think there are some really nice, there is some really nice work, and and more that I guess we can take from rodent models or human data, that there are definitely some interesting neuroprotective strategies. Um, I can't comment about progesterone. I really don't know very much about it. Um, one thing that I'm a bit biased about, which you probably guessed from my the current post that I'm doing is that the possibility for supplementing or supporting mitochondrial function. Um, I think there are different tools by which we might be able to do that. Some of those might be pharmacological. Some of those might be actually exogenous transplantation. Um, but I think neuroprotection is something every neurologist would get excited about, human and veterinary. And I think there is probably some really exciting work that we can stay on top of and, and monitor going forward. But sorry, that was a bit of a flimsy answer. When you MRI the, the patient, um, did you need to anesthetize them or, you know, because I presume some of them were demented or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something that we touch upon not very effectively in the manuscript. So I think that's a great point. The two um, effectively brain dead patients that I showed you that had marked frame and magnum herniation and brainstem compression, they were both comatose. So they required no general anesthesia for their for their MRs. Um, of course, other patients, you know, like that, the Cocker Spaniel, it would have been really amazing to have him have MRI of that dog, but he would have required anesthesia and anesthetizing a patient that's already had a prolonged cardiopulmonary arrest is not a, an appealing prospect. Um, so I think that's something that we really have to weigh up, isn't it, in, in our clinical patients, which ones do we think MRI is going to benefit um you know we're up against the risks of the anesthetic the cost to the client is it going to change the way we manage the patient probably not but then from an academic perspective if we're looking for more prognostic indicators we need to be imaging these patients so it is quite a, a conundrum um, yeah. as a clinician yeah, my next question is you know the, the is it worth to mri them and what are we gaining by mri them um, yeah. Because if in but, the end we're not going to give them, it's not going to prompt us to take any therapeutic measure like giving manitol or hypertonic saline. You know, and, and have you seen any with herniation, form and magnum herniation recovering? Could it be a, a at least? Are you able to? Are you able to? If you got certain, you know, finding like you say, diffuse brainstem changes or herniation, are you able to say, well, it's not worth to carry on? Because we've all been there as neurologists. You, usually you call by ICC. Can you have a look at this case? You know, we do the brainstem sign, the oculocephalic, and we find out, well, yeah, okay. And then the question mm -hmm. from the owner is, you know, how long do we give and should we carry on? So do you have any guidance from the MRI to say, yes, 
we can when we got these kind of things is is not worth to carry on. Yeah, but unfortunately, that's only I can only extrapolate from from human literature, really, um, and we don't have any of that validated in our patients. So, it, is that enough of a reason to MR so that we build up a body of evidence that ultimately helps us? You know, we, we mentioned briefly earlier that we're looking for things like extent of the lesion, and we know that very diffuse changes they don't have to be as dramatic as our patients. I think yeah. that would be rare in people, but you know, looking for very diffuse gray white matter swelling, loss of differentiation between gray and white matter, that would be a negative prognostic indicator. Patients that have they do a lot more quantification of their DWI in people, and they can use that quantification to help them again with prognostication. So, you know, I do think that there's value, and it could well be that you see a patient that, that has more mild changes than the ones I showed you, but still actually has yeah. a very, very low chance of a functional recovery. And actually, you know, it's fairly agonizing for the owners that hanging on, waiting, wondering, deciding when do we stop? When do we give up? And if we had a harder evidence to say, I just don't think I can give you a, a functional pet, that would be hugely valuable. But then are you going to be the clinician that starts anesthetizing your patients to build that body of evidence? That's, that's, that's the, I think that's a yeah. common problem, as you say. But you've seen some with herniation that did have a positive outcome. Well, no, the, the only two that we had were euthanized based on the okay, severity okay. of those changes. So I, that would be really interesting to know if anyone has uh, persevered and seen improvements. Maybe that would prompt, you know, doing uh, But I'm very sorry, Fred. <laughs> he's not keen on watching the ACVM business meeting <laughs> um, and he's much more interested by what you were saying. Last question, you say one more. Um, in cat cases, I've noted them to be cortically blind, but still able to track moving objects, similar to blind sight, blind sight in human. Is the tectum, if just send another message to correct, more capable of recovery than higher cortical structure? Good luck. <laughs> you got 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got very little short answer. All I can, all I can comment is that we know the occipital cortex is the most susceptible. So we know cerebral cortical neurons particularly susceptible. Occipital cortex of that, uh, the most susceptible to these um, ischemic insults. So I think it would absolutely make sense that you know the higher cortical processing of vision is compromised and lower centers um remain more intact um i think that's really interesting i think that's really interesting this whole occipital cortex being so susceptible and we saw that histopathologically as well the changes were were always the most severe in the occipital cortex so yeah cool question in that. but the fact that they go to track moving objects is not something i've actually uh, thought of checking to be no we always yeah. have usual menace but we haven't haven't done uh, yeah more I think that would be really interesting to look more. The main coon cat that I described that was, um, you know, the prolonged GA, uh, prolonged recovery from GA after a dental, that was that was the cat that on our assessment remained blind. But for the owners, sh she was convinced he had some rudimentary vision. I think more like ability to appreciate light and dark. And she would describe that he would look out a window. Um, but I never specifically asked about tracking moving objects. Yeah. So that's something really interesting. To, yeah. Something worth looking yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to end the, the question. Thank you so much, um, Abby, for you know spending the evening. I know you're quite uh, busy with a young family as well. Um, but yeah, great talk. We got a lot of uh, fantastic comment. You know, to, thank uh, you very much for having for, me for your time and um, and all that. I leave the last word for Simon. Yeah, thanks, Abby. It was great. A great talk. Um, obviously, a lot of work and. A lot to do, no doubt, it sounds like. Um, so good luck with that. But thank you very much for giving up your time. Um, it was a real pleasure to have you on. Uh, thanks to everyone who's tuned in. Um, the webinar will be available on the Facebook site um, and will soon be available as a podcast. And we'll provide you with a link on the site soon. Thanks again to Hallmark for sponsoring this session. Uh, join us again in October for another Journal Club Live. If you have recently published or have an upcoming neuroimaging-based publication, please let us know if you'd be interested in presenting. So that's it from us. Thank you very much to everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.